Good morning. I'm very privileged to be here to discuss the uh, Nukin book on bargaining with the devil and uh, to try to give an expose of what is included in this book, which I think is so important because all too often we resist negotiation when we should in fact be negotiating. Ladies and gentlemen, the book is written by Nunkin, uh, who is head of the program on negotiation at Harvard University. And what he basically does in the book is he shows a different way, a different way, the, the way of conflict dispute resolution. The book starts out where Harvard University, shortly after 9-11, has a debate. And they invite two eminent persons to put two views at that debate. Roger Fisher, the guru of negotiation at Harvard, putting the point that there is room for negotiation after 9-11. Very difficult. Nukin, who comes and says, sorry, we cannot bargain with the devil. The book, in essence, represents Nukin's journey in his quest to answer this vexing question of do we bargain with the devil. Now, I think he's being a little bit deliberate by using two terms here which are contentious. One is the question of bargaining, and the other is the devil. And I'm afraid that when you bargain, you're going to end up with something which you probably don't really want at the end of the day. The protagonists of negotiation will tell you that we should always negotiate. We should always seek a solution, Nukin says, by virtue of problem solving, to explore the interests of the parties and which options can best meet those interests of the different parties. But when we break open the positions and find the interests, then we can really start to find solutions. You have nothing to lose. You pay the price in negotiation beforehand. In war, you pay the price afterwards. Negotiation does not imply giving up anything. The concessions, your willingness to sit down at the table, to explore a possible deal, to seek best alternatives, that's not, that's not a concession which is robbing you of anything. It is simply saying, I'm willing to sit with you and look at how we can find a better way of doing other than going to war and destroying each other. But if you look at the antagonists, they will tell you the devil is going to take your soul. But I think that that is a defeatist approach. We are not selling our soul when we enter into negotiation with people. We still maintain our principles and our morals. The devil is clever and unscrupulous. Yes, we are aware. We need to transcend black-white thinking. Register a plea to think beyond categories with yourself. We don't want to see either devils or honest good people. There are many different people in between. And you and I are moving between these positions on a regular basis. Proponents and opponents are both correct, depending on the examples they choose. Unfortunately in life, we try to justify things by virtue of hindsight. It's easy. Looking at what happened and then going back. We, d we shouldn't have that luxury. We should look at the situation as it is and see whether it's accommodating of negotiation. There are great people of our times. Nukin takes this book and he uses it from here on to look at different individuals. Intra alia, our own Nelson Mandela, who he describes as the greatest negotiator of the 20th century. Winston Churchill. Churchill was a difficult guy. Germany was in disarray. Hitler came to power. Hitler wanted to restore the dignity of Germany. Churchill was chosen not to make peace, but to fight, to restore the dignity of Europe 
and the UK. The USA sat on the sidelines, making positive noises but doing nothing. Basically, Churchill comes to power and the rest of the political establishment do not trust Churchill. Churchill then decrees that you cannot negotiate with Hitler. He is the devil. And if you look at what Mandela said there, I decided it was time to initiate negotiations and I did so without asking because I knew what the answer would be. Now that's very interesting. 1985, when Kubi Kutsia started to talk to, to Nelson Mandela. Who instigated it? Mandela. He wasn't negotiating. He was having talks about talks. Then he was having talks. Then he was negotiating. 27 years of incarceration. A guy like this would normally say, damn it, the devil put me in prison. But he deals with the devil differently. He deals with the devil by not seeking recrimination, but by seeking reconciliation. Yes, he was one of the proponents of the armed struggle. If you look at the secret negotiations that happened, Mandela did not tell the ANC that he was negotiating for a very long time. He hid it from them because he knew what the answer would be. The answer would be you cannot talk to the devil. Let us ask the question now, who was right? I think both decisions were perfectly defensible given the situation within which they were, and especially if we now use hindsight to evaluate these decisions. How to make wise decisions when there are no categorical answers. The book gives you a framework, a great framework for deciding do I or don't I negotiate with the party opposite me. A wise decisional process, Nukin says, has three distinct challenges. Do a cost-benefit analysis, honestly. What are the costs of choosing option A or option B? And then ultimately we very often see that negotiation has the lesser cost of the two. Avoid psychological and emotional traps and then weighing ethical and pragmatic arguments. The book uses a Mr. Spock figure. Spock says, what are the interests that are at stake? Evaluate the interests. What are the alternatives if you don't negotiate? What's going to happen if you don't negotiate? Are the negotiation outcomes, are there those that meet the interests of the parties better than their best alternatives? How strong are the chances that the agreements could be implemented? That is very important. And that is sadly something we often forget in negotiation. What are the costs of negotiating? You could lose your credibility. Is your best alternative legitimate and morally defensible? Because otherwise you are going to have immense problems with yourself. The Spock analysis applied to Afghanistan. What were the interests that were at stake? And if we look at these for the US, it was to defend human lives and to avoid future terrorist attacks. For the Taliban, it was staying in power and it was maintaining Islamic law. Whether the Americans agreed with it or not, that was important to them. The alternatives for the US was military intervention. For the Taliban, well clearly it was guerrilla warfare. Were there negotiation outcomes that could satisfy the interests of the parties that were preferable to their best alternatives. Then, if you look at what happened prior to Afghanistan, the Clinton administration had tried for two years to get the Taliban to close down the training camps and to deliver bin Laden. This had never succeeded. How good were the chances that the agreement could be implemented? Bin Laden's influence over the Taliban was tremendously strong because bin Laden clearly had access to the wealth of Saudi Arabia. Then, what would the costs of negotiating be? Was America's best alternative legitimate and morally defensible? Probably yes, Ninkin would say, that it was morally defensible. Fisher would argue no, it was not 
by virtue of the fact that they had not fully explored the alternative. Our reasoning and the devil, we are very dualistic in our thinking models. Our first response is intuitive thinking. Intuitive thinking, emotional thinking, automatic, self-evident, instinctive. When we are confronted with a problem, that hits us first. Survival. Fight or flight. That's our first response. Although it's a natural response, has to be subjected to the full light of analytic thinking. Conscious, analytic, systematic, rational consideration. And only then taking decisions. Let's look at some of the negative traps. We fall prey to things we call tribalism. Then demonizing. The other side not only does bad things but is bad. Dehumanization. The other side is inferior, not even human. Moralism. Convinced of your own views. You are absolutely correct. You don't even listen to anybody else. The question of zero-sum assumptions. It's either this or that. And then the call to action, the missionary leader, the, the Nelson Mandela kind of person. That can be a trap sometimes. The anguish of not damaging the relationship and not falling prey to conflict is often the reason why we go into the positive traps. Then, universalism. All people are equal. We know that this is also just one of the fallacies of life. It just isn't true. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the problems we have in the world. Contextual rationalization. Every behavior can be unpacked, understood, and forgiven based on an external factor. We very often take the attributes and the traits of other people and we overplay that and underplay the context. But when we get to ourselves, we overplay the context and underplay the attributes and the dispositions. Rehabilitation. Everybody can change and deserves a second chance. Be careful. It can be a trap. Shared mistakes and responsibilities. Everybody needs to take note of their share of guilt. Win-win. The pie can always be enlarged. Then reconciliation. A negotiated solution is always better. Maybe sometimes you need levers to get to real negotiation. Remember what Mr. Mandela did when he felt that he had been deceived and that black-on-black -black violence was being fomented, he withdrew from the negotiation. And it took Rolf Meyer and Soro Ramaphosa to craft the record of understanding to get negotiation back on track. Peace call. The leader calls for conflict to be prevented. How do we avoid the traps? Each trap clouds our judgment about our negotiation partners. Most of us have a preference for one of the traps in the series. That is true. We are human. We are human. We err every day. Our preference is a function of our personal style. It is rooted in the soils of our deepest identity and our worldview. A fighter against unfairness in a hard world where everybody takes advantage of everyone else at the slightest opportunity. There is something good in everyone and we should focus on the good. Only by moving beyond the traps can we achieve, ladies and gentlemen, a well-founded analysis. Can I leave you with my most famous quotation? Shaw said on occasion, you see things that are and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask why not. I thank you very sincerely. Thank you.